Um, and I think there's one caveat just before I, I hand over to, to Helen. Now, Helen is going to discuss what's, what we called nature prescriptions. Now, that is not medical advice in any way, shape or form. So if you do have an issue, contact your GP. Now, at the ICC, we are very proud of our values and one of which is loving our environment. I think that's something that all of our, our employees take to heart in a, in a big way. So we're utterly delighted to be working with our dear friends over at the RSPB today. Helen Moncrief is joining us from Shetland. Uh, if you don't know where Shetland is, that's a, a wee tropical island on the north of Scotland. Um, and she's going to talk us through her experiences with nature. She's the, the RSPB Shetlands Islands Manager. And hopefully you can get some inspiration on how you can re-engage with nature during this time in lockdown. So delighted to hand over to Helen. Take it away. Okay, thank you, Helen. And um, thank you to the EICC for inviting me here to speak today. And thank you all for coming. And I, I hope you do ask some questions uh, when we come to the end of the end of this talk. Um, so I'm here in my house in Shetland. I'm at the southern tip of mainland Shetland. I, I'm actually on the flight path to Sumbra Airport and beside a busy farm. So excuse if you hear, hear some loud noises. And my dog is beside me and he sometimes likes to get involved with what I'm doing. So um, you might interrupt us. Uh, but as Ian said, I work for the RSPB. Uh, that's the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. And we're a nature conservation charity. Um, we were founded way back in the 1800s and um, we've got a proud history of taking action for nature ourselves but a big part of what we do is to try and encourage people to connect with nature and to help folk feel more empowered to, to take actions that can help nature and I'm sure you've all heard of the climate crisis and the, and the, the nature emergency that we're facing and we need people now to do more, uh, more work for nature than we've, than we've ever done before and to sort of build it into our lives. Um, and there's evidence that the more connected you feel to nature, um, if you feel more connected, you're more likely to do things for, for, for wildlife, to pro-nature behaviours. And uh, I would encourage you to look up the University of Derby's Nature Connectedness Research Group, and you can find that online. And connected to that is Professor Miles Richardson, who keeps a blog called Finding Nature. And um, that's my go-to for, for finding out lots of different things about science and research and just how people are connecting with nature in different ways uh, in, in Britain and beyond. Um, and as Ian said, I'm not a health expert. Uh, I don't know if I'm an expert in anything, but, um, but through my work with the RSPB and through my personal experience, I've learned a lot about the benefits of, of nature uh, and what it has, has for people. And um, I'm here to share that with you. So. So for the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to speak about what do you actually mean by nature connectedness and why it's important. Um, I'll tell the story of nature prescriptions, and that's a project that we started here in Shetland in partnership with NHS Shetland, and we're seeking to um, expand that uh, starting off in, in Edinburgh, but I'll, I'll come on to that after. And I'll cover a, a bit about what we can do to stay connected or strengthen our connection with nature during the pandemic. And that might be something more for the, for the Q&A at the end. Um, but to start us and to get us settled in, I'd like to do a little exercise with you that's, um, that the GPs can use. Uh, this is the leaf that we use here in Shetland, excuse the coffee stains. Um, but it's an exercise uh, that doctors can use as a part of their consultation with their patients as, as, uh, as they see fit. And um, we're first inspired to use it by the Grounds for Learning charity. So if you like, you can um, close your eyes or just soften your gaze and um, just set yourself into your seat or wherever you're at. And I'd like you to go back down memory lane and think back to a time when you were small and that you felt a connection with nature. So you can go back there and was there anybody there at that time? And what did it feel like? Can you, can you get the sense of the smells or the sounds, uh, textures, any sensations in your body? And what does it feel like now when you think about it? And can you get that feeling again? And that's just a bit of a starter to just know you can sort of access nature sort of within you as well from your experiences and your memories. Um, and you're welcome to share uh, where you went to in, in the box there. 
it would usually take a few minutes to go through that, but we, we're, we're short of time here. And I have a dreadful habit of um, speaking too much and going off on tangents. So um, I, I'll come back to that later on. Um, now, uh, so what do we mean by nature connectedness? And why is it important? Um, and it's really all about the relationship with the natural world and how we as individuals include nature as a part of our identity. And I'm going to quote the Nature uh, Connectedness Research Group here. Um, and they say, the relationship between people and the rest of nature, nature connectedness, is grounded in scientific study, is measurable and accepted internationally. It involves understanding that we are part of nature. It's about our emotional connections and responses to nature, which helps to regulate our own feelings and keep us mentally healthy. And it's about a meaningful relationship with the rest of nature rather than seeing it as something other. In short, it's an understanding that as humans, nature is our story. And on our leaflet, we um, also mention oh, a, a quote from Andy Goldsworthy here. And he says that um, he's a landscape environmental sculptor. And he says that we often forget that we are nature. Nature is not something separate from us. So when we say that we have lost our connection to nature, we've lost our connection to ourselves. Now it's said that nature is our story, and I'm hoping that we can show a video just now. Um, is that shown? Uh, thank you, uh, the techie team there. Um, now, as I said, nature is totally part of my story. I, you can probably tell from my accent, I'm from Shetland. And this is a video of, of where I, I grew up. I just took this last night. Um, it's where I played, it's where my dad grew up, where his, his mother was, and, and generations of my family before me. So um, I really do feel a sense of belonging here. Um, I'm lucky enough I've been able to see whales, dolphins, uh, porpoises used to be down in the show, uh, just in the sea uh, down there. My grandma lived in the house there, just on, on the right hand side. Uh, that was back in the early 1900s. Um, so I'm really, really rooted there. Um, I've had so many positive experiences just playing there, looking at all the different plants and wildlife that we came across. But, but um, and as well, sorry, there's uh, lots of archaeology and history in the background too. So as well as being connected to nature now, uh, I kind of feel a connection to my past just with, with being from here. Um, and I think when you look at uh, sort of archaeology and how people lived in the past, you can see how they totally depended on nature to, to clothe them, to feed them, uh, to heat their houses and everything. So it's, um, it's something that we've probably lost a bit in, in the society that we're in now. So our, our connection with nature is broken. Um, and some of my early experiences here helped lead me towards working for the RSPB, as well as all the wonderful wildlife that I saw and, and felt connected to. There were some negative experiences. Um, so one of my earliest memories is when the Esther Benicia uh, tanker came ashore and it, uh, we had oil beds washing up around the aisles. That was back in the 70s. And then when I was about 16, I ended up taking a month off of school to go and help with the another oil tanker that came ashore, the Brayer oil spill. So I was involved with the cleanup operation for that. So, and I've, I've seen changes in the landscape, how agriculture uh, has, has changed and affected breeding birds uh, so positively and, and, uh, and negatively as well. And um, I'm generally quite happy go lucky nowadays, but I have had some, uh, I've had a couple of episodes of being crippled with depression and um, nature, really really helped me get through that times um, it's, and anybody who's had depression know how isolating it can be and something about connecting with nature bringing myself a uh, just out of my body if that makes sense uh, out of myself uh, I could find solace in nature or I could feel energized calmed uh, and just uh, I don't know just deal, deal with, with life um, and I think the cliffs that you saw earlier on in the video there um, me and my mom have a habit of going out and releasing our emotions to the wind, which is okay in a windy sort of landscape in Shetland, but maybe less appropriate if you're in, in a city somewhere. So um, this is my, my mom and dad, Tom and Mary. And um, I'm lucky that I had parents who really encouraged me and my brother to, to be outdoors. It was just such a part of life. Um, but mom, when I was about three, she got diagnosed with cancer and then again later on, uh, about sort of four years afterwards. And 
uh, she had uh, that th from the older Shetland folk that being uh, in nature can help you uh, help for your recovery. Uh, so there was particular things that, that the old folks said about being next to seaweed or by earth that's being turned over. So, so when Dad and her were out in the peat hill, she might be uh, wrapped up in a sleeping bag or uh, out in their kale yard when, when Dad was working the earth. And all the time she'd be breathing in nature um, with bands around us. And um, it was daisies had a had a quite a, a profound impact on it. And this is just a, at the Croft House Museum beside where I grew up. And a, one day she'd been, it was a third diagnosis with cancer that was looming. A, and it was, it was, it was looking pretty bad. She was thinking that was her time was up. A, and she's quite a spiritual person, mom. And, and she was coming back for the cliffs where she'd been sort of releasing all her emotions. A, and she spotted one tiny daisy, the, the first one after the winter. And she told me that something in her, her mind and her body just shifted. And she felt since when about, um, that nothing mattered, but but everything was okay, and that life would go on. Um, so after the harshness of winter, the uh, the daisies come back, this tiny flower comes back, and she was thinking after the the harshness of cancer and illness, life would go on uh, through it through her family. But as you saw in the photo, that um, her and her dad are, are still with us today. Uh, unfortunately. A couple of other diseases has joined us. We've got um, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's uh, in the family now, but I think having a common connection with nature really binds us uh, as a family and it, it gives us um, just something to, to talk about and, and share together. So it's through um, the experiences, uh, it's just, just life really, and, and, and through work that we um, helped develop the Nature Prescriptions Project. Now, it started off in Shetland as a, a small partnership project between NHS Shetland and ourselves. And what we wanted to do as the RSBB was to get more people to spend time outdoors here in Shetland. And you might think uh, with the wonderful nature scenes we have here that people are really connected, but, but it's, just, it's just not the case. So we had a, recruited a, a new community engagement officer, Karen McKelvey. And as it happened, she was a close friends with uh, GPs and, and her dad had been a doctor. And on her first day, I showed us a couple of reports uh, that the RSPB had, had uh, produced um, that was turned into this. Uh, but it was a former GP, Dr. William Burt, good name. Uh, he'd produced reports called Natural Fit and Natural Thinking. And they were investigating the links between uh, physical activity uh, and sort of physical health and mental health with, with the environment and, and biodiversity. So I wanted to take the evidence from these reports and turn them into something, but I wasn't quite sure what to do. Um, and uh, but through Karen and through uh, working with the, the NHS health improvement team that I've been really impressed with and, and speaking with the GPs, we developed a couple of resources that doctors could use just to gently remind their patients that, that connecting with nature was, was good for their health. Um, so we, had, we produced this um, small leaflet here. Uh, that really just has a little bit of evidence about why nature is good for you and people that could try and, uh, read it a bit more. Uh, the doctors could prescribe a level of walks that people could do, but it was really about more than being physically active, it was about forming this connection, a uh, relationship with nature. And as long as, as, as well as this, we um, had a, a calendar of um, ideas. Oops, I'm not sure, no, this is the Shetland one here. Uh, and simple little ideas that patients could use uh, to help connect them to nature. So it might be something as simple as taking down your hoot or looking at a daisy or really looking at a lichen to things that are a bit more challenging, uh, like doing hill walking or going to look for uh, specific quite rare plants. Um, so just little little nudges to get, to get people um, outdoors. And it was back in October 2018 that we launched this and we thought it was going to be a small project and, and that was it and leave it with the doctors that they're the most trusted health professionals and we thought their authority to get people to go outside was, was more than uh, what we could do uh, as a nature conservation organisation. So, so it went out there but uh, you may have heard about it in the media but the, the, we were um, swamped with inquiries from the global media. Um, I'd like to thank and apologise to NHS Shetland and the, the communications team because they were just swamped with inquiries for weeks and months after the, um, after the press release went out. 
But some really exciting things came from that. We had um, a, an Icelandic organisation involved with absenteeism that were wanting to replicate the calendar. Um, there was the Danish government's National Stress Committee got in touch, one of which do, and various um, GPs in the UK and beyond looking to do something similar. So, so it really resonated with people. And um, yeah, it was, it was really quite exciting. So uh, we could see it could work in Shetland, but we wondered, could it really work in, in an urban setting? We would love to be able to scale it up across Scotland and, and beyond. So last autumn, oh, sorry, I'm chatting too much. Last autumn, we uh, employed Elaine Bradley, who has a history in being a mindfulness teacher. And we formed a project team and we decided to do an urban pilot in Edinburgh. Uh, and we spent quite a lot of time uh, developing the resources uh, and recruiting four medical centres and sort of training them up in uh, how to do nature prescriptions. Um, and we've been building relationships with NHS Lothian and then the green space people. And um, we were just getting ready to go um, live. I could show you, uh, this is the um, May calendar uh, for, for Edinburgh. You might recognize the crags up there. Um, so we're going to put this out in Edinburgh. For me, going down, walking down Leith, I was a down Leith walk. I was a bit worried because I couldn't see much in the way of nature. But Elaine uh, has lived in Edinburgh for a lot of years and knows that there is good sort of green space that's free to access. And a big important bit about this is it's it should be accessible to anybody, whatever ability or skill or background uh, that they that they come from. Uh, and we've learned from the the University of Derby's a nature connectedness group that there's this five pathways to to nature nature connectedness and if Richard can show the table there um, it's a, a you can you can get this online just look up the nature connectedness research group but it's it's about sort of reframing a relationship with nature so you can do that through having contact so using all our senses to connect to nature and it's about emotion, so feeling alive uh, through the emotions that nature brings. It's about noticing nature's beauty and finding uh, that there's meaning to our lives about this. And it's about compassion, it's about caring and taking action for nature. So we've um, built this into the, to the Edinburgh pilot. Um, we're going to do a six month pilot with lots of research uh, associated with it. And we just delivered all the materials to the, the surgeries and um, everybody was on board and quite excited about being a part of this, uh, this innovative project in, in the city. But unfortunately, the coronavirus uh, joined us just uh, two weeks after we'd started. Um, so we, we've had to put the pilot on hold at the moment, but the GPs are telling us that they think it will be a real asset as we sort of go beyond the pandemic. Uh, I think a lot of people now, and maybe you can share your experiences in the chat box, but really, really appreciating green space and nature all the more uh, during this period. Um, so if you're looking for a way to help just connect yourself with nature, you can maybe use these pathways um, to bring you some solace, calm, joy um, through this period of lockdown. Um, and some things you can do at home, um, you can simple things like is opening your window or you can watch nature documentaries that's been proven to have to have impacts on people's health you could tune into soundscapes online um, you could be more active as a family and do um a, we've got rspv's wild challenges you can get involved with and you can do things like make a, a bird feeder for your neighbor or, or, or a, a sort of volunteer to help an elderly neighbor to put some bird seeds out so they can see more wildlife from the window. And there's lots of NGOs and organizations doing things uh, to help connect you with nature. So if you go online and do a search, you just see, see what you're drawn to. But I think something we've all got is our own so inner resources and we've got our imaginations and our experiences. And I'd like to just invite you one more time to, uh, to close your eyes or, or rest your gaze and, and find somewhere in your mind, either real or imagined, a, a place in nature that makes you feel happy or content, just somewhere that makes you feel a bit good. Um, and just try and go, go back there in your mind and um, see if you can make it really vivid uh, with the colours, with the sensations, with the smells. You can maybe take in a big deep breath through your nose and, and see if you can um, imagine the smells of 
blossoms of the sea around you um, and, and really try and make that real to you and just hold on to that and, and see if you can and feel anything, uh, either emotions or sensations in your body uh, when, you, when you go to that place and uh, whatever happens you've always got that, that inside you so um, yeah so that's a little bit of a hint that can, can help you through lockdown and I'd really be happy to hear, well, have any questions or, or hear your, your sort of methods to get through this time. Go back to you, Ian. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Helen. That was lovely. Um, I had a few fantastic little comments here in the comments section. People going to all sorts of places, hearing the oyster catchers, waking them up as a child, and watching the seals, sunbathing at the bottom of someone's garden, and walking down the braes. Yeah, lovely submission. So thanks everyone for that. And one thing that I feel struck better to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that struck me during your talk there, Helen, and maybe this is a bit of a personal question. Um, and there's a few questions in the, the Q&A there that have kind of covered a few things I want to ask you already, but I imagine that growing up and seeing two oil spills would be quite a dramatic experience to go through. How, do you, how much do you think that informed your future career choice, if at all? Yeah, probably quite a lot. I, I think I always knew I was going to be in a job that was um, about caring, um, just been brought up to be a caring person. And I think just, yeah, I, I met so many people during the Brayer oil spill. And I think that inspired me to go on to get qualifications and to, to work in conservation. So yeah, something sort of fed in there somewhere. Oh, lovely. Right, so, so we've got a few questions in the Q&A. Thank you very much for sending them in, guys. Um, this is one from Colin Brown. Uh, are the nature prescriptions being done elsewhere in the world? And if so, what has been the level of success or experience? Um, so I don't think there's been anything I know of with, that's sort of published with, with GPs, but there's certainly a lot of work that has gone down. Uh, the USA is, is really quite advanced at uh, nature connectedness. Uh, and uh, I think through the universities quite a lot to try and get their students to, is to help manage stress. And I think in NHS Tayside has been trialing something for the last year or so. So a lot of things is still uh, sort of in a piloted time and to gather the evidence uh, to be able to roll it out but it, it is a it is time consuming because uh, we really want it to make work uh, make it work in, in the first six months of nature prescriptions in, in edinburgh has been about um it's a liaison with the medical practices uh, getting the research right because we want to be able to to scale this up and we need to be able to cost that out and um and then get stakeholders involved so um so I'm not quite sure if it's been done in the same way that we've done it, but I think it's. I think we were the first to be doing it with, with GPs prescribing nature in, in the way that we do. But I think they've been doing it informally uh, for a while. So doctors who are connected to nature themselves are probably more likely to prescribe nature. So something that we're doing through this project with the urban pilot is to try and uh, encourage, well, to help the, the medical people be more connected themselves we want to look after their health and well-being as, as, as well as, as their patients. Sorry, but a big wandering answer there. <laughs> no, no, that's brilliant. Um, okay, one more we've got here in the Q&A. How are you going to measure the positive impacts of the Nature Prescription Programme? Do you have any metrics that you're going to use? Yes, we do. Uh, there's, a, there's a Nature Connectedness Index, which is a, 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 a used um, scientific measurable tool is, is there's a psychometric what's it called a psychometric not a psychometric test but it, there's, there's tools there that we can use and we have a social scientist that's involved with our project team Jolene Hughes and her, her PhD is in uh, in nature connectedness and uh, getting people to be more uh, her research is all about that so we've used her to um to de design the research both for the patients and for the GPs as well so we'll be um, we'll be looking forward. I want to press fast forwards to finish the pilot so we can get all the information back uh, to to build it up. But we're we're just gonna have to take take baby steps as we go along. No, I bet. Yeah, it's such um, unfortunate timing as well with the lockdown happening just two weeks into it. But yeah, it is. Mm. 
But we do know, um, so that one of the GPs was in touch uh, a week or so ago saying that they are sending out the resources to people in their sick notes because they're conscious that it will be a, a really useful, useful tool for them. Oh. And sorry, another thing to help, it may be in the, in the chat box or a, on the website afterwards, is we had a wonderful visit from the Doctor magazine a, from the British Medical Association. And they did interviews with the GPs in Shetland that were, that were using it. And it was really interesting to hear from the doctors after we launched it. Um, one was saying how they found it, um, so using the leaflet, was it a, 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 they don't want to medicalise patients. And quite often he said, particularly men don't want to take pills and they don't want to talk. But he thought using nature prescriptions was just a really good, good tool to deal with mental health problems in particular. Yeah, I imagine that's, that's true. Then from personal experience, I, I picked up another nerdy hobby last autumn and started to, to do some amateur mycology. So I've been trundling around forests and woodland areas with my head firmly pointed towards the ground looking for mushrooms and I've got to say it's it's a really I mean I'm not a spiritual person personally but it's a very spiritual experience it's it's just lovely being out and amongst it and the, as you say the smells and the just be the, the sounds all around you it's beautiful mm. yeah, one of the GP my first pilot had said it was like an extension of mindfulness it was nice to hear that yeah it sounds like it it really fits in well we do have another question here in the chat from Matt so if someone is given a nature prescription, is it up to the individual to go into nature or are there support groups that can take people on trips and so forth? If so, are there any volunteering positions to help with that? <laughs> That's a really, really nice idea. So at the moment, it's, 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 like, a, it's like a personal contract with the patient and the GP. And it is, it's really, it's not self-help, but it's, it's, it's for the GP and the patient to, to work through together. But a... Uh, we can direct people, so in, in the calendar of ideas, we sort of direct it to people, to organisations that are doing things in, in Edinburgh. Um, and that's going to be part of the research because sort of social prescribing is, is subtly different. So I think that's happening in, in different uh, surgeries uh, around Scotland and, and the UK as well. Um, so that is something that would add extra to nature prescriptions itself. And yeah, get in touch if you want to volunteer in future. <laughs> All of a sudden, we've got a whole bunch more questions in the Q&A here, so I'll try and rattle through these. From Bill Nicol, do you feel knowledge enhances the experience? You hear a song and look for a bird the size of a chicken, and it turns out to be a robin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I think knowledge, it can do, but I sometimes wish I didn't know so much because I can find it quite overwhelming. So I've deliberately not learned about the stars so I can just enjoy them for being beautiful. So, uh, but yeah, anything that can trigger just a bit of a, I don't know, just a bit of inspiration. And, uh, and from knowledge, you can go like to understand and a uh, concern and then action. So um, yeah, if you have some sort of knowledge and understanding of a subject or, or, or a, a habitat, whatever, then you can help do more for it. So, so yeah, some knowledge is important but not critical and that's the wonderful thing about nature as well is you can get as much into it as you want a like i'm a total nerd i'm proud of it <laughs> and a and it's really good you can just get into enjoying looking at a tree i've got a bush blowing around at my window and you can just look at it you don't need to understand it it can just be be with it this is a, a really lovely question here from, well, the names have been submitted, but 4026220 says, I'm a nursery teacher in Edinburgh. I'm trying to share my garden with my class lockdown on Twitter. Can you suggest simple activities I could suggest to parents in flats? Well, parents in flats, I would, I think, I'm not too sure, but maybe we can share some resources on this because I'm, I'm so lucky that we're here in Shetland that we've got a lot to do. So in flats, I don't know if you've got shared gardens, but so, well, this weekend, actually, there's the, there's the, was it next week? There's the World Dawn Chorus Day. So just simply opening up the window and listening to the birds that's there uh, and trying to tune in to the different rhythms and the, the sounds and the pitches of, of the birds at different, and in the morning but also later on through the day. So, so just listening is something. And then I think going on to the RSPB's Wild Challenge page would be good. 
and uh, to get some activities he can do indoors from making uh, uh, crafts through to, to actually getting out to connect with nature too. And um, I don't know if, if the parks are open in Edinburgh, it's tricky just now with the, with the lockdown and what we're allowed to do uh, with the government guidance. But um, a research line, or if we can get in touch, if we could leave an email there, we can see if we can get in touch from our education families and youth team. Definitely. That's a good, that was from uh, Margarita in Edinburgh, by the way. Uh, so thanks very Thank much for the We have, well, if I could suggest one thing, <laughs> I'm not getting any kickback from this, so uh, please don't, don't doubt my intentions, but I actually picked up a small bird feeder the other day. It's got a two-way mirror, so you can actually see the little garden birds coming in there. Um, and I'm living in a flat just now, and it's lovely. It's actually really nice to see what birds are coming to my window every day. So there's potentially an idea for you. Okay, just one more question for you, Helen. Um, I think it's good to caveat this, saying that none of this is medical advice once again. But Kate Carter asks, what conditions does a GP prescribe a nature prescription for? What conditions? It's, uh, we don't really hear that at the moment, but that's a part of the research. So we'll find out what they will be um, a prescribing for. Uh, and we've sort of broken it down into different kinds of categories. Uh, but I know people that's been uh, prescribed in Shetland uh, for but it was a stomach ailment and uh, the doctors said they could take the pills or they could try the nature prescriptions and if that didn't work they could come back and the person sort of did the regular walk and sort of connection with the nature around them and it turned out that the stomach problems was linked with, with anxiety and stress and she's not had to go back for the pills. Um, but there is sort of evidence that it helps with a high blood pressure, um, to mood general satisfaction, uh, and oh, I can't remember now, but if, if you have a look at the Nature Connectedness uh, website, then there's links to papers in there uh, for, for specific conditions. And I know, I think, in, is it the Glasgow Spinal Unit? They have an area so people can, can see green space outside. I think it's like ornamental plants, but there's some evidence that just seeing house plants can help with, with recovery after, after operations. So I'm sure there's a huge variety and I'm looking forward to finding out what the, what the doctors do after the pilot. Helen, thank you so much for your time today. It's been really fascinating and uh, yeah, all the best for the, the Nature Prescriptions Project and everything else you're doing up there in RSPB as we go along. Thank you so much. Oh, and thank you. And thank you all for, for joining us. <laughs> Sorry we couldn't get through all the questions, guys. There's a few more on here, but please do keep engaged hit us up on our Twitter, EICC Live. We also have a YouTube channel where you can see our previous EICC Live online. Um, and looking forward to the next one, it will be next Tuesday, same time, same place. So keep your eyes peeled for that one if you've not signed up already. But all we can say is, if you guys are interested in anything that's been said today, I highly, highly recommend you check out RSPB online. We've got a really active Twitter and uh, the website's great. And I think, personally, I feel that one thing we need to bear in mind is once the coronavirus is over, once we're out there in the real world, we're still in the midst of a climate emergency and a massive loss of species. So amazing organisations like RSPB are really leading the charge and battling all these problems that we're going to be facing further on down the line. So once again, thank you so much, Helen. Thanks to all the guys at RSPB. And we'll see you all again next Tuesday. Cheers.